I'm uh, South Portugal, not Algarve, but Alentejo, a little up noon from noon. <laughs> uh, my word would, will be wisdom. Pass it on to someone. Uh, uh, Grant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Grant. I'm calling from the Netherlands, the south of this huge country that they call the Netherlands. And uh, you will hear in everything that I'm going to say that my word is urgency. So I'd like to pass it on to Deb. Thank you. I'm calling from the Great Lakes state in, on Turtle Island. And uh, two words, but one thing, moral courage. And you pass it on to... Sorry, pass Someone. it on to um, uh, yeah. Sarai, is it? Hello there, um, Sarai. Um, coming to you from um, Portland, Oregon, United States. And um, my word is non-hierarchical. And I pass on to Midi. Hi, I'm Midi. I'm in Chumash land in Southern California. My word is shared. Thank you. And I will pass on to Phil. Thank you. Media and hello everybody. Um, I'm in North Cadbury in South Somerset in the UK. Um, I think my words change maker. And has Courtney, have you been here? Courtney, over to you. Hi everybody. Um, I don't know what we're doing because I came in late, but I'm going to pick a word and it's stoked. I'm stoked. <laughs> Can you say that again? Maybe it's an American word, stoked, which means excited. Stoked. All right. No, I, I'll just briefly tell you, we, we, we just were trying to find the first word that comes to your mind when you think of what you want from a new leadership in the world. Adaptable. Great. Thank you. And... Uh, you don't know who was I was going to say, Naomi, please. Hi everyone, um, I'm Naomi, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, right now I'm in Utrecht, which is in the middle of the country. Uh, and my word that came up was authentic. And I pass it on to Mercy. Thank you, Naomi. I'm Marcy, um, uh, inhabiting Chinook lands um, in the same city as Saray in the state of Oregon, USA. My word is space, and immediately um, after that came deep listening. Oh, and I pass it on to... Uh, Deborah, have, have you yes, gone? No, thank you, Marcy. Um, I'm Deborah. My feet are on the ground in Colorado, U.S. And my word is integrity. And... We had I think... Kim and Rachel. Kim? Well, I guess my screen is not big enough. So I invite Kim, is that right? Okay. Thank you, um, Deborah. Um, so I'm Kim and I'm in Glasgow in sunny Scotland. As you can see, I've got the sun beautifully streaming in the window. And my word is equivalent. And I'll pass it on to, sorry, I didn't hear the other name. There was one other person still to go. There's actually more, Midi, Ellen. Darpan. Shanti. Great. 
Mm -hmm. I'll pass on to Midi as a familiar face. Hi again, Midi, and pass on to you. Midi's been, are they? Midi's been, yeah, that's I, all right. I've gone. So, Sorry, not Midi. Elena. I'll... Elena? I, I already, the other Elena. Yeah, Elena. The other Elena. I yes. don't know. <laughs> Helen, have you already? Helen? <laughs> okay, go for it, Helen. Sorry, I was getting confused there. Yes, Jenna. sorry, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm Helen and I'm in London in the United Kingdom and my word is co-creative. Wonderful. So if somebody hasn't spoken yet, this is the opportunity, but I think... Open. No, I never. Great. Yeah, I mean, I... Open, hi, yes, thanks. I see you. Thanks, no, no. No, I, I am actually, it's a uh, quarter to one in India. My, my, not my feet, my whole body right now in India. And uh, in a part called not, uh, National Capital Region. Uh, I mean, you know, I think with every word which I heard, I think a lot of things changed. And uh, now I'm just feeling, uh, will Black Lives Matter will be considered one word? Black Lives Matter. And yeah, that's that's the word I want to give. I will pass it on to uh, Shanti. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, Shanti, uh, she wrote before on the chat that she had to go get something. So we'll update her when she's back. Great, thank you. Is anybody missing? I think everybody's been. Um, How about Sari? Oh, Sari. Sari, she's been. Great. Um, I think we move on. I, we have a beautiful collection of words. I have uh, put them in the chat and we will, be, we will be part of our harvest. So I just briefly want to tell you what we want to do. Um, and it's to have maybe a short framing or, or, or the vision that, which are probably two different visions, but have some similarities, some um, overlap that Grant and I are looking for ways of bridging two kind of worlds. Um, so Grant is going to introduce his side and then we, I hope we will get some of your experiences in bringing those two worlds together um then if we have time i'm going to tell you my part and we will have another harvest and then whatever if you have any so we can't hear every one of you but i'm really happy if you if you have something that you want to contribute just put it in the chat and we will see if we can address it during the meeting and if not i'm sure we will have plenty of time to have discussions afterwards um so that would be towards any time and then at the end if we have time we can make one of those uh i, I was told not to use the word bomb today but whatever uh, when we write every everybody at the same time in the zoom and that's about it and i would like to share what we would like to have as agreement for this session and grant please just in interrupt me or add anything that you think I'm forgetting. So we would like you to be in the service of the intent of the session and the session intent is basically to be in, in just what we've done um, to co-create or to come up with parts of how we envision a new leadership that we need to solve the very urgent problems that we have that span from social problems to climate crisis. Um, so we would like this to be, a, again, a group of people that come together to be in service of that intent. And you're welcome to be here and listen if you, if, if, if you would say, ah, oh, this is not really for me, it's fine, but then we would like to have priority for the people who want to do that. Then. We would like you to accept the role of the hosts in maybe nudging or or you know saying oh could you go back to the to the 
subject um, so that we try to stay within the intent. We would also like you to contribute from personal experience. So this is again, not a discussion about opinions or about concepts, but we would really want to know, okay, what has worked? What, is, what are the key things that you say, okay, I've done this and we got a result. That would be fantastic. And uh, in order to respect also the time of other people who may want to share, if you try to go to the essence of your message and, and again, we could just collate, co collate the, the details and, and everything in, an, in a different shape. This is more like a harvesting of snippets and in that sense as well just be respectful and allowing space for other voices to be to be heard great so if if someone is not in agreement with the agreement please speak now or remain silent forever all right um so without more ado uh over to you grant Thanks, Dita. So what I'm planning to do is take the next eight or 10 minutes just to sketch you a vision which has driven me to this point. Um, you should know that I have worked for Philips International for 36 years. So I was a member of the corporation, which in a sense was feeding the beast in the old box of finances and uh, inequalities. I'm trained as a designer. And five years ago, we parted company, the Phillips and I. And in the meantime, I have taken up faculty work and coaching work at the Think School of Creative Leadership in Amsterdam. So my latest forte is the development of leadership and the delivery of programs to do that. So that's where my brain is coming from. Um, I experienced a personal epiphany a few months ago. Um, there was always this irking feeling in me that there's more than just people-centric innovation or empathetic or empathic uh, innovation. And then through a few friends of mine, biologists, but also good writers, I was exposed to um, viewpoints from the point of view of regenerative practices. So regeneration. And understanding that right now, if we continue the trend that we are on, the what they call um, Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day in a year when humans use more resources than nature has the ability to replenish. That was broken, that was exceeded in the, in the early 70s, that long ago. In the meantime, our Overshoot Day for this year is the 22nd of August. In other words, we've used the resources which nature can replenish by August the 22nd, which means we are on a household budget of one and a half planets. If this trend continues this way, we will require three planets by 2070. And so it was that realization that made me think, all right, what can I do? I have a friend who's writing a thesis and the theme of that is at what point of knowing it, does it become a vital lie not to act? And I've reached that point. So now looking at the perfect storm of economic inequality, social injustice, climate change, something radical has to happen. And so I am committed to challenging leaders today and the ones aspiring to take position in the coming years to take on regenerative thinking, regenerative practices. And like me, there's something in their innards, their heart, their gut, which is visceral saying, there is more than this, only I'm not necessarily tooled up to know what it is. So collectively, we are starting to understand that there's not a lot of time left to keep the planet sustaining life as we have known it. Only we do not have the, the collective wisdom to know what to do. 
Now, through the eyes of regenerative practices and regenerative cultures, there are ways and means, not, none of them easy. Some of them are based on inner work. So learning to become an empath empathic being within a natural ecosystem, but they're also doing activities, ways that you can respect local um, infrastructures, local cultures, local histories, in order to put in solutions or benefits, which will be evolutionary as opposed to finite. And so these practices of thinking and doing are at the core of the program that I would like to bring. Now, let me add to that, that a program on itself is not enough. If you're bringing such a thing, you're actually taking a position, which means that I will look for the public stage, not just me, but experts that we can gather around events like this so global conversations about leadership and what has to happen so on one hand we have a movement driven by public debate and the intent there is to amplify all of the voices which are moving in that direction whether they be grassroots eco villages or top level challenges from politicians but to amplify the, those voices and to accelerate the rate of change of wisdom into wisdom of, of decision making so i do not accept the area of human comfort i do not accept the idea that i cannot do anything about this therefore i go into lethargy or i become a hopeless being and so what i'm proposing is that with regenerative practices, regenerative thinking, inner and outer work, if we can approach and captivate, magnetize leaders towards this eco-awakening, this way of creating those moments where it becomes a vital lie not to act. That's what I'm setting out to do. And so it has some of the back to nature, esoteric, being practices, but it also has some very practical thinking frameworks, which are a shared vocabulary so that people can buy into regenerative practices, regenerative projects. At the end of this, we have to give back 50% of the planet to the wilds in order to retain the semblance of dignity and life that we know at the moment. There are going to be calamities along the way. Pandemic is one, but I would say that's a fairly benign one. Is that we're going to get a lot of climate related uh, calamities as well, which will make us sit back and think again. And I'm sure that three, four, five of these are going to come before we can actually create a tipping point. I would like to think that we can create a supernatural movement, which is approaching leaderships, leadership, ourselves as well, in order to push that change in mindset faster than it would in a natural way. So I think I'll stop there. And I think the question really is to each of you as to whether out of personal experience, one, you can either share or not share what I've just uh, related, or and whether you've been in a position which is somewhere in that story of mine, whether it be towards a corporation or a social impact uh, group or to politicians or just to a group of aware people where these kinds of practices, you've tried to bring them in order to improve their state of being, their mindset, in order to accelerate this move towards regenerating the planet. So I'll stop there and I'll leave that just to simmer a while and. Uh, see what kind of responses that you have. Yeah, and maybe I, I would like just to emphasize what Grant said at the end, that this is again, not a debate about how long we have, how bad things are, how good they are or whatever. It doesn't really matter for this. If we have things that make life better, that's, that's what we need. So I, I don't mind starting. 
if it's okay. Actually, not with a lot of answers, but with a few like nuances that uh, I, I think is important. One is to really acknowledge that what we call leadership is quite encompassing many, many things. So there's this kind of, you know, explicit leadership of because of certain role or function someone has, but we all in different places in our lives have some sort of leadership role, whether in family or in group of friends or in some event or whatever different kind of things. So yeah, that that's important. And with that comes another kind of realization that is that um, I think the idea of the hero's journey is falling apart in these times. And so the, the idea that of leadership as the, the, the person that saves the day or that really shines a light on, on, on the direction makes less and less sense in the particular times we are living where it's highly complex, volatile, uncertain, quite ambiguous. So is a place where we don't want to rely on a single person perspective to move forward, uh, in my opinion. So that, that informs me about like certain ways to think about both how we can, what kind of capacities or qualities anyone should have while kind of um, assuming a position of, of leadership or being recognized as a leader. And also then on how we can kind of support the development of those capacities. And I think the final thing for now is to say that um, Definitely for me, thinking about leadership with, a, with a, a view on the future and the future we want to bring to life, uh, uh, the work that that Presencing Institute has been done of this kind of movement from ego to eco is like, it's kind of like part of the conversation. There's no, no, possi no possibility to have any other place of departure, I think. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say as a starting point. Thank you, Nuno. I would like to share, uh, and I believe I have some really solid experience that was invited uh, with this offering. Thank you, Dita and Grant. Uh, the Climate Change and Consciousness Gathering that I organized uh, a little more than a year ago, was led by the foremost speakers on the topic, Christiana Figueres, Vandana Shiva, Bill McKibben, Uncle Anganak, Shutikat Martinez, many others who are recognized as leaders. And I came away from that gathering with exactly the same conclusions, Grant, that you've come to. And since then, the infrastructure of climate change and consciousness has been devoted to building what I call unprecedented leadership. And that unprecedented leadership being a groundswell of leadership from the standpoint of my level of expertise, which is in regenerative practices, somatic regenerative practices based on the mind-body connection, my particular area of contribution is in inner climate transmutation. Uh, and so I have been devoted to that, but simultaneously in the cohort of uh, climate change and consciousness, we are focusing on amplifying indigenous voices and also the power of generosity, this giving to uh, the most underrepresented voices, the greatest platform uh, through our particular contingent of walking the land, but it's, it, it it's ex expands exponentially. So I believe that I have some solid evidential experience of the need for inner climate development, primarily for white people. Uh, and the value of this groundswell. In other words, bringing the voices from the bottom up as opposed to top down. 
and, and the tools for, for doing that. And I do believe that women's voices, along with indigenous voices, the voices of people of color, need to be foremost. So cultivating and creating an environment where that's possible, which requires generosity, is really what I'm devoted to and what climate change and consciousness is devoted to. Thank you, Stephanie. I see some uh, quite pointed uh, comments in the chat. Perhaps one or two of you would like to bring that to the fore. I'll just go ahead and do it. Um, my lived experience tells me that there are human beings around the planet, I'm one of them, who has a capacity to interact with non-human and other than human realms. And in my experience, uh, what we are called is psychotic, crazy, and we are drugged and locked up. What our leadership needs is uh, the ability to embrace the human experience of communication and learn how to take that communication into um, realms that we don't listen to ordinarily and to bring that into the power structure rather than drugging it, locking it up and silencing it by shame. Um, I was, and I'm just going to speak very briefly and say, I saw this time coming in 1974 and when my aunt and uncle took me to the psych ward and I said, we are becoming one, we are developing a new capacity and that's a telepathic capacity to communicate with other realms. We are going to realize we're one human. I watched them write down bizarre rambling, paranoid schizophrenia, and I've lived with that my entire adult life. Um, and now I'm seeing it happen, and I am considered one of the irrelevant in our society. So I just want to offer that the leadership needs to start taking into account that there are those of us who have capacities that are marginalized in this society that are absolutely necessary for the survival of the planet. Thank you, Ellen, for sharing that. Yeah. That's that's beautiful, and I, I I agree absolutely. Do you have any idea how how to make that bridge? In from your experience, how 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 do we make you part of the leadership? The way to make that bridge is to is to for those who are the dynamic out there stepping out, willing to you know be in the limelight leaders to begin to uh, to assemble uh, councils of people who are interacting in ways that are not um, societally necessarily comfortable. I am not comfortable speaking to what I know in a large social situation. I'm not comfortable speaking to what I've seen and been shown. But I would be in a, in a consultation with those who are carrying forward or wanting to carry forward a plan so it's, it's, it's by virtue of inviting people who see the world and perceive the world differently into a, into a more contained environment um, and, and developing a broader perspective on the challenges and the opportunities that are arising in those challenges. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Would it be okay for me to speak now? Yes, please. Like, yeah. And just to notice that Sarah has been raising her hands. Oh, well, I can oh, wait after Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What's that, Yayo? Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Yayo. Um, just from my experience, I think you cannot talk about leadership without talking about power. And power is this driving force of um, what we just mentioned of what is normal. And I love the saying in Mandarin, if you say I'm going to be in this leadership position, what we say is you're going to serve the society. So it's about humanity and it's about 
it's actually not about you. Just get over yourself. It's about what the role requires you to do. And sometimes it is indeed to be strict, uh, to take the authority, but sometimes it's more of what is missing here. What are the voices and how can we make that bridge? And the one being in the leadership position has to be flexible. So I have to be able to talk to people in their um, language. And if I'm not able to do that, then I have to organize that so that those voice can be heard. And I feel that often when it comes to leadership, there's like this golden kind of glitter things that everybody wants to be a leader. But it's like in the kitchen, if everybody want to stir the soup, uh, then you got an inedible soup. So leadership is also about stepping back, seeing what needs to be done, maybe shut up for a while <laughs> and always realizing what space am I taking at what expense? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. And I know that you have actually, you're doing a lot to you know, brings things like that to the community as well, as far as I understood. So can, can you give me an example of how, how, to, how to make that happen? I think it's a great question. And it, it really, at least from my experience, it has to do with centrality. So, and it's normal when I'm in the center, I can't see everything. It's like driving a car. I need those side mirrors. So it's really just, just think of, at least for, for me, from my experience, and I'm, I'm so curious of your um, experience as well, but I think we need a lot of somatic exercises, uh, awareness training, just to, Indeed, just to get over yourself, let go of your ego, <laughs> uh, and, and, and really to see what needs to be done. And sometimes it means washing the dishes <laughs> and not get, get the compliments. Thank you. Um, do you? I, I want to. Yeah. yeah. Can we? So there was there was Kim wanted to say something. Can, uh, can that wait, Nuno? Yeah, yeah, well, actually, I was going to, I was going to push for my rank as organizer and talk about rank very briefly because it's totally connected with power and it's the the, the thing that we all have, you know, an advantage uh, that that can take us to, to know, be recognized as leaders in different contexts, depending on how we rank there. So being a man in many places today is a big rank, but also being able to speak out in public, like Alan was saying, well, I, I prefer to speak in smaller places. So definitely that is another rank, but there's many, many ranks. If you are a bit taller than other people, you have rank. So to be to be to be dealing with issues of power in collective spaces it, it demands a very 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 acutely aware uh, awareness of these of rank how how much we have rank over others and how we can support uh, uh, that that kind of centrality to be to be left to a place of more equal with the margins because what, what Sarah says is really important. The, the movement of power is always from the margins to the center. And the closer we get to the center, the more disconnected we get from the margins. And that's kind of, that's a pattern. So we need to be aware of that in order to kind of get, get a sense of the whole and work together on that. Thank you. Sorry for, for showing up rank so strongly, but I guess it helps too. To, to Le leading by example. No, no, leading by example. That's 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 the idea. Um, right. Um, so I'm going. I'm going to pull rank now, and I'm going to say Kim and Darpan, and then we're going to have a brief intermission. Thank you, Kim. I, yeah, not at all. I appreciate you um, holding a stack. 
that's what we call it stacking. So what am I going to say and what am I going to try and not say? Hmm. So for me, I am working with a whole plethora of toolkits. My main one I would like to introduce you to, I'm sure Nunu has already heard this um, from Eve, but, um, um, but it's sociocracy. It is not the only answer, but it is the beginning of something that is about to transform the world, and it already is. It has done it to southern India, it is happening across the world, and it is very much a global forefront for how we transform the, the work that's going on. It is working with power with, so I haven't heard anybody talk about that so far. It's a really important uh, dis differentiation. Power with is where you come here. What we're working with currently, and most leaders are working with power over. Also, if you want to be a leader, you shouldn't be a leader, just to be clear. You should not be a leader if you want to be a leader, because that is not the person you want to be actually in a leadership position. So it's about starting to use certain language and understandings of ourselves and discernment is a very important part of it because that is also a really important thing that we are not doing enough of when it comes to the misinformation that is going on round about us, not just information in general. It's about looking at both and thinking and this is where conscious communities are moving to sociocracy as part of their toolkit because they are realized that all the other toolkits that are all there are not thinking about both and, they are either or. And that is a power over thing again. When we look at also transformation, it is a really important thing to look at is, I call it, <laughs> I'm working with this and this is the work that I'm doing is looking at how we suspend our disbelief. Now, I hear everybody talking about your want for change, but I'll tell you some of the hardest people I find to work with are people like yourselves. <laughs> because you don't want to suspend your disbelief because you've invested so much in the things that you're invested in, you can't hear what I'm coming up with. So I would like to suggest that part of this work that we're all needing to do and I say for myself as well I do not leave myself out because I know I have also a need for my for people to cover me for my blind spots and that's what sociocracy also does it covers the blind spots um John Buck who is the lead, an international specialist if you're looking for books John Buck's one of the few um, that has written a book about sociocracy also Ted and Jerry uh, Terry it uh, Ted um, Jerry Koch Gonzalez and Ted are part of this, I believe, um, maybe as well. Um, and they're writing, they've, there's only two books in sociocracy. But John Buck talks about the fact that with sociocracy, you can hand power round the table like bread rolls at the dinner table because you're not scared of losing your position of power. You're not scared of not being heard because the thing is, it doesn't change if you're elected into a position. It allows you to share that with an equivalence toolkit. And the last thing I'm just going to bring in is um, also about how it is about moving from the head and the hand into our heart space. And a massive part of my work as a community worker, as a sociocrateer, as well as also as a change thinker and revolutionary, I am all about the heart space and I celebrate the people that I see here that I know have been in class in groups that have been talking about heart space. But transformation does come from within. And if the person that you, if we do not move away from idolatrification, in other words, idolizing, move away from idolizing and start looking for ourselves. If we can't idolize ourselves, if we can't celebrate ourselves and look at what we're doing and celebrate our faults, our, miss, our missed, takes as well as also our celebrations we are all going to fail because the thing is this is not working and we've had this for hundreds of years time to transform and i would love to share this power with you all and i hope and look forward to that time thank you thank you kim for such a great contribution mm -hmm. um darpan you 
great you unraised your hand i don't know if you still want to say something yeah i mean uh depends data please feel uh, free uh, if we have uh, over shorter time i will share later on great um so uh, i just would like to bring my side of the story before we continue harvesting and um maybe it's also kind of a a calling into right never mind i had many years working in academia in science and um it was a bit traumatizing because a lot of the skills that i knew i had already from before and a lot of the skills that we are talking about here like using our heart more than our mind or not not more but in combination with our mind and and our knowledge uh using our emotions bringing somatic work all that all that was considered and it's because it's, it's not in the past i just stopped a few years ago um all that is your personal life the things that you do that are your inner work that's your personal life and you leave it out of work and in my view um bringing those tools into discussions at that level bringing those tools into places where we need to solve conflict we've seen it in this summit those tools bring efficiency in my view bring a co-creative genius sometimes i mean we've experienced that in, in in spaces like this how when we are really speaking from the heart things just happen at a at a speed that is just amazing so i think i have that sense of urgency that grant was speaking about um and i'm not i i don't this is going to sound horrible it's not that i don't care about the earth it's just i think the earth is going to be fine when we are gone it's not so much but for me it's not about saving the earth it's about having a good life and if anything leaving when we leave leaving the house a bit in order having good manners so i i, I have the sense of urgency i don't want to just work on myself and i'm uh, this is going to be and i'm going to work on myself and i want to bring these tools to the people i know can have a big impact so coming from bottom up which i think is absolutely necessary and having leaders using the tools that we know are working so again i know i, I know many of these tools and i still haven't managed to myself see that happening in for instance science which was my my um metier and i know in some places things have changed in politics but not so much in the uk yet um so again if i would love to hear somebody say okay hey here i have done this and this and this tool and it has brought me this 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 and that and and also all your opinions about um what leadership is and stuff. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi, this isn't, this is Courtney, and this isn't about my experience, but um, I recently listened to the physicist Brian Green speak, and he just wrote, you know, a book that for him felt really vulnerable because it was really personal. So it may not necessarily be the same work that you're talking about, um, or I don't know what level of heart space different people are at, but if somebody's moving in that direction and doing something as brave as telling a personal story or a series of them in science books, to me it's like, yay! And, and having a class um, that feels vulnerable to him and invites vulnerability from his students when they're talking about the field of science, you know, the leading edge of physics, to me, indicates that there are people in positions of power um, who are at least willing to go there, willing to be vulnerable. That's great. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, you, you've been waiting for quite a while. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's one of the leadership new leadership skills you need to develop is definitely patience and good listening <laughs> i 
I really want to, I'm going to start just by passing my, my art of hosting Stuart hat to Sarah and Kim, because like anything that need to be said from that front had been covered by those wonderful contributions. I, I'm i going to talk from a experience of how we are trying to uh, exercise and experiment new leaderships and an organizing system in a big alliance called Ecoversities, that it's a, a 300 plus alternative learning centers around the globe that we are in alliance together and have a body of governance for uh, the three cents of funding that we have and how to spend it and how we gather and things like that. And it's all inspiring something that, that uh, we didn't invent this way, although sociocracy and other tools of dialogue and organization have been used, but we didn't invent this by ourselves. We just stopped for a moment. So another thing I want to bring here and Nuno will might rem remember this phrase because we use it in the merchant network for a while, for, uh, last year. So imagine for a moment that the solutions that we're trying to find for the problem, to solve the problem, are actually part of the problem. So, uh, so what we did was stop for a moment, look around us, like how does nature and things and societies organize themselves out of outside from these one lenses of wide western centeredness of uh, efficiency and growing up and be the best or white and black and what we could find in between because we are a collection of people from all around the world of all kind of cultures and, and differences between us so we noticed that one of the uh, particularities of leadership in the indigenous communities around the world have to do with the power with and not with the power of that Kim was talking about. So for example, in Oaxaca, the place I live, where more than half of the municipalities of the state govern themselves with indigenous practices, there's no salary for any governmental position that they are you are assigned not by the majority, but by consensus of a community assembly that point you to be in responsibility of administrating the, the village funding. And you cannot say no, unless you want to leave the community and stop being part of the collective. So there's a lot of problems between this human right, individual, myself, mine own privilege, uh, sorry, rights, or whatever you want to call it, and they because they are subordinated to the need of the collective. And so what we intuit from there is that maybe these cultures have been surviving in America, in the Americas, uh, for more than 500 years because they know how to put the, the need of the whole before the need of the individual, right? Uh, so when you said building the good life, el buen vivir, as we call it here in the Abjayala, it means the good life for every being around us. So one of the keys that we have done in Ecoversities is we volunteer to do the shit that needs to be done, allocate funding, promote people to do their uh, regional projects, exchange between different alternative learning centers, all of that by, by volunteer work of the members of the network. And we take collective decisions uh, in global gatherings that happens once a year. And there are certain things that always we cannot agree all that should move on. But we have learned by this tool that we are trying to practice that we call senti pensar, how will that could be translated to English? Feel thinking, no? The, this process of feel and thinking at the state to make decision and to walk. Uh, that maybe is not that important if we spend a lot of energy and time to get an agreement and a consensus and we cannot reach it. Maybe that issue is not that important and could wait until we are in a better place. To, uh, to talk about it or make decision about it. 
And just to close, I, I, will, I want to close with a Zapatista phrase that has been my, my anchor and my, uh, how do you say this in English? No, no, the, the, my north star, like the star I follow to find the path that he said, preguntando caminamos, we walk by asking. So I really wish and hope that the new leadership in the world stop, ask what is needed, and then start to take action on it instead of deciding what is the action we need to take. Thank you. Thank you, Yale. Thank, Thank you, you, Yale. Sorry, Sarah. Sorry. But it's all right. I cannot get your name right. <laughs> um, yeah, I speak. Um, my position is um, from also the corporate world, from project management in a small medical manufacturing company. And um, I think one thing that was coming to me while listening to all of you is that um, it starts with the breath and what I mean by that is um, uh, many of us have developed ourselves, you know, and spent a lot of time doing this inner work. And when we're in places where um, many people might not, might not be diving into these same rabbit holes, um, it's hard to, I think, remember, I think there's a remembrance that we need to have of the very small tools that have helped us um, find these paths of leadership. And um, something that has been a part of my journey is um, <laughs> accessing these places of leadership has meant that um, I feel like I have to hide many parts of myself and I have to do this ninja work. Like <clears throat> um, this work is, you know, taxing and on the mind, the body, the spirit, energetically. And um, I find allies like few and far between. Um, uh, it's holding a dual consciousness in almost everything I do. And, um, um, like I verbalize, you know, wanting more transparency, but at the same time, there are tools I feel like I have to use just to keep my position. It's almost like how some politicians work. And so, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, just to underscore, sharing small tools and somehow finding new ways for people to get on the path of leadership without having to sacrifice so much of their person um, are things that really are true for me. And, um, I think that's all I can share right now. There's a lot more, but a lot, a lot is coming in. Thank you. Thank you. And I would love to know more uh, at some point. Um, yeah. No, no, I know you raised your hand. Sorry, Grant. Yeah. We've got Benita and we've also got uh, Nuno. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I, I just wanted to allow Venita to go first because we've heard you, Nuno, a couple of times. So just to have any voice. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we are talking about slowing down, need to pause, need to listen, perhaps more than doing more about saving, it's doing less so that we can reduce the harm. Because whatever we do, we are you're doing from a certain mindset which keeps contributing to what's already happening. 
So one of the things which I find very, very important is our whole education system and parenting through which we are, you know, next generation is being prepared, who's going to take charge five years, 10 years down the line. And how do we, uh, how do we really create a space for this generation to grow in such a way that they stay in touch with themselves and with what is around them so that they can really listen. They can listen to themselves. They can listen to what's happening around them and they can produce an authentic response to what is happening instead of rushing for some solutions based on certain concepts that they have heard. So I find that 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 that's one of the one of an important area to which I relate. And children, adolescents, young adults who are there's so many young adults who don't know what to do because. You know, there's so much of confusion. So how do we really create that pause where we can listen? My question. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. Back to you. Well, uh, oh. Yes. Or or Darpa. I don't know, no, no. Would you Darpa? Go, 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 yeah, Darpa. Thank you. Darpa. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Nuno. Um, I think uh, I think this is something which I was. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do we bring those skills to the new leadership, and how to make that help? Uh, you know, I think the first acceptance uh, when we say that we have we may have born unequal, but we don't have to stay there, is acknowledging that uh, there is a there is a difference, and uh, and I think it is only when I when I give up power that when uh, when the process of uh, the process of uh, e equality uh, at least uh, you know gets onto the table of discussion and i know the word that there is no win win is not a very uh, uh, you know it doesn't sound too good but the fact of the matter is the fact of the matter is i feel uh, where anand girdardas makes a very pertinent point is that the people who have too much uh, cannot stay there when the people who don't have at all, uh, there has to be a loosening of power. And that's where I think a movement like a Black Lives Matters is a very critical aspect of leadership, is that the people when who have too much have to give up power. They have to know that the leadership is about a common goal. And for reaching the common goal, I have to take that space where I have to give up some amount of that uh, that luxury which I am uh, having, and especially with respect to power, which I think has been discussed a couple of times. And I think that's a one point. And I, I think I won't deliberate into what Anand Girdar Das uh, says, but uh, I, I think that's a one point I would like to make. And the second, I think, is a fellow uh, Dutch historian, uh, Rudger, I think the other aspect of it is uh, it's also not a such a doomsday. Like I think the whole conversation is that everybody is bad. Uh, people are there to get us. You know the, these conversation. Oh, if I if I if I am on a uh, if I am on a certain state uh, stage and certain power, then that means that somebody who doesn't have the power is there to get me. And I think that is creating a fear psychosis in people. And I think that's what another thing which we have to talk about. He actually, his book, Humankind, and I, I don't think one has to possibly read the book to get what he's saying. Maybe a couple of interviews will drive home the point. I think historically there is enough evidence that human beings have come together and worked together. If we come together, actually the notion that uh, people uh, are all bad, people are all 
you know people are uh, people are all uh, there to uh, make only think about themselves and not think about the community i think these are certain notions which are so ingrained in my mind that i am never able to think about the community at large and i think uh, rutger talks about it and i think i really feel that is an important dialogue that human beings are not uh, about uh, we are not we are not all barbarians right right over here and i think that's one of the uh, the second thing i want to sort of share that when we talk about leadership i think the first is about giving a power but that doesn't mean that the people who are actually giving a power are losing it because overall if our societies are safe then i am happy and that's what i feel one of the thing which is important and last but not the least i think we also understand that you know some of us do treat earth like a irritated drink right it's like a you know it's like uh, we can milk it till the others will never r- run dry is kind of our attitude but then there is an also an attitude that uh, says no no i think we have to think about uh, uh, that how can we take care of our earth so i would say these polarities are are part of our leadership and we can talk about it when we actually say that for me the two things which i mean the question talks about actionables and for me first and foremost is to come to a space that where we one we say that okay i have enough power and maybe two white people discussing about black, black life matter not having a black person is again a question that who are we deciding for and therefore i have to give a power and come to that space okay let's find you make an effort and find that person whom we are talking about and the second part is that the people who, uh, who the dialogue and counter this dialogue in in uh, uh encounter this dialogue that everybody is bad we are all we are all nasty people and the people who are only uh, come to certain space and are on spiritual journey are the good guys i think that notion should be challenged for leadership so for me that uh, these are the couple of points which i feel uh, might be helpful for us to leadership and what we can do thank, thank you doctor no no yeah well just to comment very briefly on the thing that darpan said i think that th- that perspective of win lose only happens if we measure the shift from a, the current way of thinking because if we look really into what's happening most people who embody today's narrative of separation who are in high places of power they sacrifice big time a part of their humanity and they are in a way also victims of that story so if you look at like i know a few of them who have a lot of issues uh, personal inner issues uh, relational issues in their lives because they chose to embody that sense of power over like like kim was saying so i think is really if we look at win win in the perspective that power with you gain so much with that then then it's win win so I just wanted to say that about what you said because in all the rest I really agree uh one one thing Kim mentioned about so did Kim didn't mention about sociocracy which for me is really important in doing a shift is also is moving from consensus to consentment because I think consensus is very oppressing and consentment also allows for something very important that is that we keep the idea of diversity really close because the problem with equality is that of course we then kind of get a number on on diversity because we want everybody to be in the same place but what we actually should be striving for and I go back to the conversation that Ellen brought is that we want a diversity of people to be part of the conversation and to kind of make sense together on what is the best way forward otherwise it will always be it will be more problematic and go, recovering a bit of something of the work of uh, Otto Scharmer and the uh, ULAB people is to say that when if we're thinking about change so the way change happens one thing is definitely we shouldn't be looking at one way because today what we need i think is to figure out where we are being called to to nurture a change and all places have their own there's many different roles so everybody in their own place have something to to bring forward so just ask yourself what is it that in from where i am i can bring forward at the distance of my arms because that is the fundamental fundamental question to be asked and change can happen in many different places me and me and grant we are doing a course together on regenerative uh, development design 
with the people from Regenesis, which I strongly recommend. It's uh, been an outstanding learning experience for us and for me particularly. And, and um, one of the stories that one of my um, uh, mentors there, Joel Glensenburg, with Glensburg, which is also one of the interviewed uh, people for stage three, uh, he, he tells a story about a guy, they were working with this guy that is big development, uh, one of the biggest development companies in the US for, for construction. And, and the, he's going on his car with his, with his son one day and the son, uh, they are having a conversation and he says, look, this is the new place I'm going to be building something. And the son asks like, so this is the place you're going to destroy uh, more of nature. And that made a big shock for him and was just that little thing I mean, we could think about thousands of courses and stuff, but that little moment kind of shifted his mind and his heart towards a different direction. And finally, just one last thing from my side is this idea that, of the, that actually these two things. One is a lot of what we said, like Darpan called something really important in some of us about this kind of inner, but it's not inner all individual, it's inner also in systemic, like the invisible aspects that shape the way we show up. And we need to operate there because that's where, you know, that's what, from where sh shape emerges. So if we're talking about shape of the way we organize, we take decisions, everything, they come from this inner, uh, the invisible space. So we need to start to become artists of the invisible and we need to be very delicate. And so any kind of, so I, my question is like how to develop a delicate leadership that really takes care that uh, this kind of very diverse, set of things we have been talking about comes into place. One thing that for me that is crucial is if we think about projects and initiatives and things for change, we often start, the starting point is our dreams and our aspirations, and then we put the project as at the heart of that. Can we start with asking, what is the place we are living in, or we want to intervene? What is, what is that place wants to manifest? And, there, and then ask like how we can make a process where we can start to ask, what is the place wanting to manifest? What is the place potential? And then anything we do is kind of nurturing that, uh, that hypothesis. Sorry for the time. It's all right. Um, uh, Kim, you've raised your hand for a while, but I, I would, if you don't mind, I would like to, because we're, we're kind of uh, going towards the end, I just would like to see if there's somebody who hasn't spoken yet who would like to share something. And you can, you Kim, you can blame it on Nuno because he took all the time. <laughs> That's, that also goes with rank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm not so, feeling so things are very equivalent right here, by the way. <laughs> no, they're not. Um, that's true. Um, that wasn't part of the agreements anyway. So does anybody would like, yeah, Deborah, you're mute. Yeah. So, you know, I'm okay when things aren't equivalent. Um, and I'm so glad Nuno brought up rank because if it's acknowledged, then I trust that it flows, right? Because there's so many different kinds. So I just wanted to put that on the table because Without all of you that have organized this container um, that has restored my hope over the past three weeks. Um, so I recognize and I honor rank. It's just when rank isn't acknowledged and those that have most of it often don't acknowledge it. But I have not experienced that here. So I just wanna acknowledge that. And the other, the other three things, I think I put this in the chat. Um, restorative circles have made such a difference in my life and sociocracy, um, consent decision-making and initiation rituals, community rituals, um, I will say have made the biggest difference. And when those have been lost, especially recognizing the mysteries and moving with that energy, things have gone sideways. So I just want to acknowledge how much I've been fed and nourished by that space being held here too. 
and thank you. Can I ask you a question, Deborah? I'm, I'm really into the importance of initiation. Um, so again, do you have any idea or any suggestion how to bring something like initiation processes into a corporation or into, you know, a place where that is not yet established? Yes. Not at the personal level, but at the institutional level. How do we make that part of our decision making? Um, well, I will just speak from my direct experience working in philanthropy, which is kind of like a corporation in a lot of ways. Um, some of the rituals, the despair rituals, one of the most powerful that I've brought consistently around people that come from different places, just holding that space to acknowledge all of the frustration, all of the feelings that we bring to the table, changes the energy from the very beginning. So I will just say, those rituals, I can think of Starhawk's rituals, I can think of what was the Robert Bly's men's movement rituals, um, I can think of a mix that are generative, it just builds trust from the very beginning. Um, and something else just came to mind, but I can't remember it right now. Something that's happened here. Um, reminds me of it so yeah we can do this all right i'll pick your brains later then grant you would do we have 10 minutes um the question to to kim help. um yeah with with the time in mind kim can you say what you have to say within two two minutes or three minutes give it a go I'll be even quicker than that. So range of tolerance, another part that I didn't mention in as well, I appreciate very much. Thank you for mentioning consent. Consent, range of tolerance is a vital part of all the work that we're all doing. We need to look at how we can expand our understanding of what that means. Range of tolerance is about looking beyond just the black and white, the, the, the polarized thinking. So absolutely look into that for yourselves. And the other part, um, just to add in to Deborah, thank you, Deborah, that was some wonderful things as well that you said um, about the ritualising is uh, circle work. So like um, you can build that into really easy corporate work um, and um, looking at just how you can provide space for people to be able to, like one of the things that I do within my work um, is about embody, uh, embodied experience. So I believe that that's part of the work that has to happen is that people need to embody the experience. And one of the things is that I just get people to put their hand on their heart and ask them to breathe and give their, their perspective. But I can stop now, just to let you guys finish. Okay, but thank you, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Just thank for, you, Kim. Just for my follow up, Kim, could you write in the chat the practice that you just mentioned? Thank you. Peter. Over to you. Okay, so first of all, I am so, so grateful that all of you turned up and how you showed up ready to contribute, but you were also very respectful to each other. Great stories. So first of all, the reassurance that we'll be keeping the chat because there's so much richness in there as well. And I will be spurred on to follow up with you personally, as long as I can find you. Um, the other thing, it's, it, what, it, what it brought home to me is, there is a shared urgency only it can, it's voicing itself in different ways. One is the trust that the planet will live on beyond us. And that as long as we are working on ourselves and working on making sure we're having a dignified life with everybody, then that's enough. What you heard me say was, I don't consider that enough and I will not rest until I have shifted that as well. And I hope that I'm one of thousands if not millions who are trying to do this right now maybe spurred on through the covid uh, pause and some would suggest that it's actually not long enough i would say we're going to get a second chance at that but it's making a lot of people a lot more receptive to the kind of conversation that we have just had so i'm super grateful i have uh, discovered a next level of humility by listening to you all and 
taking on board what you were saying. And uh, I'd just like to thank you. Also, Dita, thank you for co-hosting this. I'm really pleased that you put a strut against me and got me so far that we could actually do this. Nuno, Yeo, who's left also, thank you for your support. And I hope that we can continue this conversation beyond this session. That's my hope too. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Grant, for playing along as well. And I, I, no, no, I, I really, I really would like to have an interview with you. I mean, like I interview you and we put that in the summit because some of the things that I've heard in the interviews is just basically you speaking. So I really welcome your contribution and I, di I didn't mean to say, you should shut up. I just wanted to listen to other people too. <laughs> Very good. Thank you both of you for calling this. It's amazing. All right. Well, I'm going to save the chat now. So if you've any, got anything to chat, say in the meantime, then shove it in there real quick. Yeah, there's time. Grant, do you want us to put the emails there for those who want to follow up this conversation uh, yes, somehow? Yes, please. And those who have already done that, they know that I do follow up on these things. So, yes. And also, since uh, we already know it's official that the Mighty Networks platform is going to stay after the summit, I suggest we create a group about new leadership where we can continue these discussions and maybe have meetings and share tips and our progress in expanding the mindset, the heart set of the new leader, leaders. Well, actually, and ourselves. The, tool, the toolkit, the toolkit yeah. of our new leaders. Exactly. Honestly, it's no one thing. It is a multitude, and that's what we all have Absolutely. to help each other find. Absolutely. There's not for me, there's no or. There's no time for or anymore. This is an and time. We do and everything. Uh, that brings me, I'm, I'm going to say it now as well, because uh, Nuno and I haven't spoken to, the, to this specifically together, but I think you've probably got the feeling already that I would like to be instrumental together with the Emergence Network in setting up a leadership summit sometime early next year. And the great thing is that I now have the buy-in from the Think School of Creative Leadership to actually be full partner. So we're on a good course, I think. Yeah, th that's awesome because I was just feeling like that we were coming to the end of conversation and my feeling was we're just getting started. So. Yeah. <laughs> everybody i have to go to have a to, to have a dinner with my kids and wife so thank you so much this was lovely thank you all j just one notice that we have in a one hour and a half starting the first of two sessions to invite everybody to sense make about the journey of the summit and also starting to look ahead so today is hosted by bob stilger from new stories would be great to count on your presence there. It feels going to be a very exciting space also to co-create. So thank you everybody, see you later. Yeah, I think I also want to thank uh, you, Grant, and every participant. Uh, it was really amazing, and hopefully, uh, we can also move towards uh, how do we create, co-create some actions. Uh, I think that's also, I think, one of the sense I was getting from the conversation that there is a sense of uh, action which people want to take, uh, and uh, and as whatever capacity of, uh, as a leader, and also I think how do we and how do we uh, get across to people who are also uh, maybe at a position of uh, uh, power in terms mm -hmm. of their leadership? How do we engage them in these kind of conversation? Mm -hmm. And how do we uh, how do we do those actions where uh, they understand they they get? Uh, uh, so I think that's a question I am I am I am also reflecting in my community uh, and a community like this. This is also my community. So I think I'm reflecting it together with everyone. Totally with you there, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Right.
thanks for coming on. I don't, Shanti, I think Shanti's not here. Unfortunately, she was uh, otherwise taken, I think. Yeah.